Hello, my friends, and welcome to the next Divide and Conquer version 5 point something, version 5 beta, because this is not the current release build of the mod, but the actual work in progress build for the next version, which whichever number that is, if it's going to be version 6 or version 5 point something, that has not been determined yet. Just know that this is a work in progress new build of Divide and Conquer. Now, the Kingdom of Gondor did win the faction vote, and so I will be playing Gondor. However, I do still want to play Anduin since there was a lot of interest in my video where I talked about the next faction. A lot of people actually voted for Anduin. It was a pretty close vote, relatively speaking. So I do wish to do an Anduin campaign. I don't know exactly when that will be yet. Probably within a couple of weeks here as I get back into the swing of things playing Divide and Conquer and doing campaign videos. I think I'll probably shoot to do the two campaigns, maybe every, maybe get two videos out a week would probably be a good pace for me to shoot for, especially because it's a lot more casual just to sit down, play the campaign, and just kind of talk and narrate as I'm going on. So pretty simple intro today. I don't do anything fancy. Izzy does all the fancy stuff and I respect him. For the effort that he puts into his cinematic intros and his storyboarding. I absolutely love it. If you haven't subscribed to Izzy, follow him for his Medieval 2 content with 3rd Age Total War, Divide and Conquer, AGO, all those goodies, and he is a great YouTuber and a great player. But anyway, we're going to get started here. This is going to be Gondor on very hard, very hard with some special rules, and I will go over a few of the changes that have happened, I guess, since the official release of version 5. So the biggest things is the engine overhaul project has now been implemented in Divide and Conquer, so you're going to see all the benefits thereof. The biggest thing currently is a religious overhaul. There are now new faction religions, or specifically their cultures, but there are now new cultures for many of the factions. So to give you a quick overview of that, as I close up these messages, Harad has their own faction or faction culture now. The uh, I think it's Southron. The Ardenheim, of course, still have theirs. Khan has their unique. Uh, I think Khan is either now nomadic or they might still be followers of Sauron. I can't quite remember what Khan is using. But the Easterlings now have their own Easterling culture, and Dorwinian has their own Dorwinian culture. I think if I bring up onto a settlement here, we might be able to see some of the different cultures, but we won't see all of them. There's Southron, Northmen, followers of Sauron, and Dunedain. I don't think I'll have another settlement that's going to show some of the other ones. Oh, here we go. The Gwythrurium, or Gwy Gwythrurium. I, someone can correct my pronunciation on that. The Gwythrurium refers to the peoples of Anadwyth and the peoples of Dunland should Dunland turn against Sauron. Or, sorry, not Sauron, but Saruman. So Dunlin at the start of the game is actually a follower of Saruman culture along with Isengard itself, but if they betray Saruman, they will become Gwathurim. Uh, I think the men of Bree still have, they might also be either, they're either middlemen still or they got switched to the Gwathurim. I think Bree is still middlemen and then Angmar uses followers of Sauron, but there are also followers of Melkor that are seen in Gundabad. And I believe the Goblin to the Misty Mountains might also be under followers of Melkor. So it's split between Melkor, Sauron, and Saruman for the evil and orc nations. Then Easterling, Southron, Nomadic, and the Kingsmen for the Adonaiim. And then, of course, Dorinian has their own religion. So there's quite a few new religions in the game now. Some of the other changes that are in progress would be Dale is going to have a... They have a completely new roster. All the units have been implemented. Uh, there are still some UI stuff and descriptions to be done with Dale's new roster, but that is all in the game currently. I don't think we'll see any of that during this campaign, but we probably will with the Anduin campaign. At the very least, maybe we'll join in as a reinforcement, or maybe we'll be able to recruit some sort of Dalian mercenary. We can show off some of the new roster there before Dale has its own campaign scripts that are fully fleshed out and ready for playing. Once Dale's campaign is good to go, I will be playing a Dale campaign. Uh, as for any of the other changes, uh, the Galadriel model and portraits have been implemented, or at least they're in the files, but Galadriel is not currently 
used in the game, but those are made for now. So Lynx made a submod for version 5 that has a Galadriel in it. Uh, and so there are plans to actually fully implement that later on. Uh, I'm just looking at the rest of the changelog here. The other main thing that's going to impact this campaign as Gondor is that there are now new visuals for all of the Gondor mainline units, uh, including like the uh, Lasarnok Axemen. So our Gondor infantry, spearmen, and archers all have new uh, visuals courtesy of Larinian. Additionally, there are also going to be new defeat traits. So depending on the generals that you fight and defeat in battle, you will get a special trait for doing so. So if we were to say fight the Witch King, we would get a trait for the commander that fights and defeats the Witch King in battle. I believe that should also work for, oh, what's his name, uh, Gothmog, who will probably fight pretty earlier on. I, I'm sure Gothmog has one and any other miscellaneous, like not miscellaneous, but any other major named characters. There's 82 of them that are now in the mod. So, for example, I mean, I'm sure if we were fighting Gondor and we killed Denethor, Boromir, Faramir, there are traits for them. I'm sure there's going to be them for uh, King Theoden, Eomer, Aragorn, Gimli, all those characters and such, and probably some of the starting kings. If I had to guess, every starting faction leader probably has some sort of defeat trait that you can gather by defeating them in battle. And that's pretty much the gist of the major changes. There's other things that have gone on in the background, other miscellaneous changes that have gone in. I'll probably link the changelog if that's still available for the updated version in the description um, if there's public access for that, which I believe there is, but I'll, I'll check just to be sure um, at the end of the video when I edit this later. So the other notable change that we have, this is like the last one I'll get into, since it does affect our campaign, is that Deninian is no longer a pike general, but Denenian has been given proper Gondor infantry. So just a little bit of a small change over there. Here he is, Gondor infantry for Denenian. And that's that's basically it. So, and I need to make sure I have always allow building and recruiting turned on for this campaign. And I might need to do that each time I load it, which will be a little bit annoying. And now, finally, before getting into the actual campaign itself, I, I've been rambling on for a while, but I want to get this all out of the way at the beginning. I will be playing this campaign with some special rules, and I've put them here in the welcome message. This is just on my end, so you guys won't have this welcome message on your end, but I put it here because I thought it looks nice. Command levels, a general may lead an army size equal to twice their number of command points plus their bodyguard into battle. Captains may move to reinforce an army or settlement on the map, but they cannot attack on their own. Garrisons are not limited because it is assumed that each town or castle has enough provisions for an army. A defender may also sally out of a siege without restrictions. So that just means, for example, we have Denethor here. Denethor has six command stars, meaning that he can have 12 units in his army plus himself. So that would make 13 units. Although there's probably an argument to be made that your faction leader should bypass that restriction but I don't really plan on using Denethor offensively at all. I think Denethor is just going to hang out in Minas Tirith, so we're not going to worry about that too much. But someone say, let's look at uh, Forlong. Forlong has four stars. We could have nine units in his army there. And I'll try not to use general stack spamming too much. I like to kind of restrict myself on that. So I'm going to play with a loose roll of like maybe two to three generals for army just because it's it would be fun to have like Boromir, Faramir, and Lasarnok in an army together. I just think that's quite fun to have, although it can become quite overpowered as you have these three, you know, decently strong regenerating units that can happen or, you know, come back to the battlefield. And the other role that I also have here at the bottom is that I will not be using militia units in this campaign except for policing or town guard duty. So Gondor militia, archer, cavalry militia, and Territorial Guardsmen are counted as that. And so basically, if I had them in Karasos here, he's just going to be here for... Basically, this is just a police force or a town guard. I'm not going to be able to send these town guard out with us, with Forlong the Fat and go, say, besiege the Black Gate. Instead, we will rely on professional elite Gondor soldiers because all of their lives are valuable and we only want our men going out with the best training and the best weapons there. So without any further ado, let's just get this campaign rolling. I did also allow for a starting trebuchet just because they're fun, all right? They're cool, and it's, it takes a while to get siege works going. And it's Minas Tirith. It's got to have a trebuchet. So I'll probably just garrison that in the fort for now just for some free upkeep. Probably the same with one of these units. The Archer Militia aren't getting free upkeep either. 
I'll probably go ahead. I'll put these Fountain Guard in that fort. That should give the Arch Militia free upkeep as it's doing. And then we pretty much have to decide how are we going to play this campaign. So because I want to have basically a turtle setup here at Care Andrus and Western Lewis Gilead, somewhere up here I want to have my main military hub. And I'm thinking that's going to be from Kalanhad and Minas Tirith. Although there is an argument that Care Andrus should be built up also. We're going to need to get the guard barracks as soon as possible if we are going to be getting Gondor spearmen and Gondor infantry out on the field. So that will be my first order, which means we need to get the governor's quarters. Now, I usually like to go for a builder's hall first, and I think I will because Minas Tirith is going to have a lot of building going on here. So you're going to want that 20% uh, time reduction and that 15% cost reduction. So we're going to go mason's halls into governor's quarters, into the barracks, and then we'll go from there. Now, Kalanhad can make excellent mining income. Uh, what is that, 400 there? 450, so there's an argument to be made for that. That's a tenth of the cost of the mines. I could make the Mason's Hall. That's going to save some money on the mines, about probably about 600 gold or so, maybe 750 gold if I'm doing the math right in my head. Plus, it'll save a turn on the mines, so they'll become five turns. So we're going to do that Mason's Hall into mines. And just typically, I, I play with Mason's Halls. They're a very... Very good starter building. Now the other settlement that we're going to want to invest in is Longelen. Now Longelen or Galen or however you would say it, uh, I'm going to say Longelen because that's what I'm used to. This settlement can make a ton of money as Gondor. And the reason being is that the ports here, it's misleading. It says you only make a little bit of money, but you actually make a ton of money. So we'll start with the Mason's Hall because ports are going to be expensive and they take a while to make. But once we have that built up, this place is going to have some serious cash flow. Until then, we will play with the taxes a bit. We're just going to go left to right with those. We can't do anything with Anulond. Anulond is just going to hang out. We will get meeting halls. Meeting halls are going to be useful for free upkeep. So we'll grab one there in Anulond. Saralond has a unit of Gondor Cavalry Militia. So we're probably not going to get any early units here. Although if we grab the meeting hall, we actually don't even get to build anything. With the meeting hall do we not get our we don't get our militia from there we actually need a barracks for that so we won't get a barracks at a village level so i don't think there's anything we can get at saraland at this time it just needs to upgrade so probably here land clearance low taxes get this place built up so we can get some free upkeep units in there calumbell can also make a decent amount of money we'll put those taxes on the high i still want some growth Check the grain exchange, and it's going to be a lot of administration for these first few turns. In fact, we're not getting free upkeep on those Gondor Militia, so do we want to make the Mason's Hall upgrade here? I don't think we will. I think we'll just have these Gondor Militia probably go sit in this fort over here, I'm thinking. Or maybe in these forts to help defend against Isengard and the such. It's kind of hard to tell. I have this unit that's basically worthless that I can't use because of my uh, restrictions there so we're just going to move them towards this fort for now and where the fearless will hang out there uh, same in ethering we're going to need to get these meeting halls to save upkeep on our generals so meeting hall there these garner militia can just make it to that fort save a little bit of income which is what you want to do in the early stages here Karnos, um, Eorthorn won't be getting free upkeep anytime soon so the question is do we take Eorthorn out He's only 280 gold, so I think he's okay for now, but I'm probably not going to invest in Tarnost at this time, as our funds are somewhat limited. We are going to want free upkeep at Fanulon, so for now, Gondor Militia is going to go hang out in the fort for that reduced upkeep cost. We have free upkeep here in Brethel, but not for our bodyguard, so we need a town hall there. Largear is an okay settlement, but I want to save my money for these three. So I got Carandros, and maybe I can make Carandros be the siege settlement. Maybe this is the place that gets the... Like this could be the place where I recruit all of my artillery, or I can make this be my blacksmithing hub. Either that or West Osgiliath. It's kind of hard to tell. West Osgiliath is kind of my preference for that, although I believe if we get the practice range here, we can get Osgiliath veteran. So I think I want... Archery here in West Osgiliath, Blacksmithing at Care Andros, and Siege at Kalanhad. That will be the plan. So we'll get the Leather Tanner working first at Care Andros. That'll give us a little bit of money. 
We don't have any free upkeep here either. And that can be an issue. We have a few units sitting in the fort. It's a little risky to have them out there. But I think we're okay for now. We could grab an Athelian Ranger or bring back the Athelian Rangers from the Gondorian Fort over here in Henneth Anun. And additionally, we might want to recruit a second Fountain Guard for defensive purposes. Since these guys are basically going to carry us to pretty much throughout the entire campaign. Now here, if we're going to make the upgraded practice range, we do need to get those meeting halls upgraded. Boromir will keep his elite force here on the defense, and we are out of money. We're going to make very, very little, so we'll just turn up the taxes for now. And we're up too high, as long as we have a little bit of population growth, that is good. And we have some public order, and I, want, I do want population growth, so I won't turn that down. And I think that's every settlement. We might actually want to use Blackroot Veil vale Archers in this campaign because we can't use Archer Militia offensively due to the restriction. But I do think I want to send them westwards. We want to take Kirthior and potentially Thoragrandos out here. In fact, this is a great way to see all of the religions. Look at that. So followers of Sauron, Saruman, Melkor, Shadow, Dunedain, Kingsmen, Elven, Avarin, Dwarven, Northmen, Middlemen, Guathurian, uh, Easterling, Southron, and Nomadic. So there are so many cultures in the game now, which is just, it is great for just the feeling of the game, the feeling of the mod. Every faction is, has their own identity there. So Haradrim aren't going to be able to recruit their units in Rune and vice versa until they change the culture, which is a nice change. So I, I like that very much. I think we'll have this spy just check out Mordor for now. Get tabs on them, see what's going on. Of course, we have Gothmog's army over here. And we probably want to draw Faramir earlier than later. I think I'm going to do that now. We'll bring Faramir to this fort. And I think I have free upkeep in Karandros with those guys. Although I couldn't quite make it. That's going to hurt a little bit on the economy. We're making a little bit of money. It's something, right? We could turn the taxes up in Minas Tirith. But it's going to be rough going for a turn. So we'll end that turn. Probably have a battle on the next one, since Mordor is very aggressive, and they do attack Gondor very early on. Alright, it is now the second turn, and Mordor actually didn't besiege Eastos Gilead. That's very much unheard of. Normally you just see him go right there, but they didn't this time, which is interesting. Sun Borthor up to the north. We'll just keep eyes on the Dead Marshes and the Black Gate, see who's going to be pouring in from that direction. Now garrison Care Andros with that free upkeep unit, and probably will bring these Condor Archers back. But these Athelian Rangers can also get free upkeep, and we're looking better than we were before, which is nice. Now I will have an issue here with these Rebels, but as long as I don't build land clearance or anything at Kalanhad, I won't have to worry about the economic penalty. Now we're not going to have money for a little bit, but once the buildings are done, we'll turtle for a little while, get some extra funds in. Then this guy here. I do want to have here Lewin. He'll probably have to go fight Captain Canyon over here, along with Denanian. That's probably my best plan to deal with these early, early game rebels. And I should, should probably send these Gondor militia out. Oh, well, it is what it is. Basically, here Lewin is going to be our Western defender. He is going to be the man to help us with our Western battles, dealing with pirates and eventually expanding into these regions here. Here's the Eeyore and Thara Grandos, but we won't have much to use until we have some proper proper units out here. Now, we can get fiefdom units, so we can use the Anfalos pikemen. I will send these ones out to reinforce here, Lewin, for now, since they're not doing anything else. And arguably, it would probably be good to send the Blackroot Vale archers out. We are making a thousand gold now. I will send one of the Blackroot archers out to the west to help here, Lewin, and Denenian conquer these regions. So that is one hard part about throwing the militia away into garrison duties, but it makes it a little more tactical. In fact, I have two units not getting free upkeep that are militia. We will bring these guys out to this fort. Is that the closest one? There's also the one by Forlong. We won't really need to worry about that. And unfortunately, Forlong doesn't get free upkeep at the moment. He costs us probably, what, 380? 355? We'll keep him in there. He's making like 150 extra gold, and he will become a good governor over time, but I do plan to use Forlong offensively in this campaign. That's about it for this turn. I mean, very quick, we don't have money to play with. We moved our armies. We could get a diplomat and start getting the trade rights and map information, get a little bit of money that way. That would certainly help. And actually, do we have 
any navies? I just thought about that. I don't think we do. We don't have a navy to start with, so we don't need to worry about ship upkeep at this time. But there might be an argument to get a ship so that we can ferry units across Karasast. Maybe take some of these southern settlements, because if we don't help Dol Amroth, they will certainly fall. And Captain General Boromir has a what I've resented. We will just go ahead and take that so that we can get some hits and further faction heirs in the tree. We have the Stone of Anor, so this is just talking about the Denethor script. Feel free to read about that if you would like. I will not be going through that one. Checking our marriage celebrations. Good job, Boromir. The goblins in the Anduin Vale are at war. That is to be expected. And now we're actually making some money, about 1500 per turn. Turlin got an architect, and our new diplomat got a swift horse, which is going to be nice to help him get around a little bit faster. We'll probably send him out to Cannes, see if we can get anything from them. Now, we do have Q stalled. That's okay. Looks like it's the one in Minas Tirith, because we just don't simply have the money yet to get the governor's quarters, which is okay. As for any other buildings, Anulon got its meeting hall, so that will help with its upkeep. And we'll probably what I'll probably do out here is, I think Tharagrandos is a proper castle, so we'll have Tharagrandos be our proper military outpost out here. But I think we'll need to take either Kirithior first, or we can leave Kirithior for Isengard as a buffer. Take Tharagrandos with our forces, and we should be okay if we do that. It looks like we do have a little bit of corruption happening over here, some devastation. A lot of corruption, actually. That's one big issue here. We're losing 466 per turn. And this is actually Lon Gallon's region, so we're losing a ton of money to devastation, which we need to amend ASAP. Two big things that are hurting our income, corruption and devastation out here. So what I really need to do is bring our capital to Ethering. Either Ethering or Tarnos makes it better. I think Ethering is slightly better for our economy, so I will do that. We'll make Ethering the faction capital, and let's see what that's doing for us now. That is significantly more income. We are now making 2,700 over the 1,500 that we had before. I should have done that on turn one. We would have been a little better off for money. Now we're making 601 at Lon Gallon. So that's another thing you want to do is Gondor. Change your capital to the middle of your empire. Yes, it's a little strange, but it's going to get you so much more money. Um, we could also get Onphalos Pikemen from Anulon. So we could have Hirloin with the Onphalos, the Blackroot Vale Archers, uh, and Denenian. But we wouldn't be able to use Gondor Militia or the like. I think... Because we have pikemen, I feel pretty good about fighting this army with just pikes, Hirloin, and Denenian, but I might grab one more. Oh, that's going to take all of our money, and we won't be able to build anything else, so I don't quite want to do that. How much would the grain exchange get us here? Yeah, not too much, but you know what does give us a lot of money is grain exchanges and trading at Calumbel and Ethering. These places have a lot of potential for income there. Or at least they should, if I remember correctly. I could have sworn they do. I guess over time, they'll make a lot more money. Uh, the question is, where do we want to actually put our next amount of funds? It would be good to also get the fiefdom barracks in Minas Tirith. That'll help us get additional funding as well for our empire. But yeah, we'll invest in Ethering for now. Get the grain exchange there. And maybe also in Lon Gallon, because it's cheap. And we'll still make plenty of money on the following turn. Mordor is finally besieging East Osgiliath. So we're just going to hang out. We're going to let them do their thing. We're definitely bleeding a lot of money with this army, but it's better that we let them throw their bodies against the garrison of East Osgiliath than for us to send our bodies against it. And we can always throw in this trebuchet wherever we want to assist with the battles there. Ermir is now betrothed to... Uh, is that Eureth or Loreth? I think it's Eureth. I think that's an I there. We'll go ahead and take that. There was a suggestion in the Discord to amend the family tree so that Farmer is properly married to Eowyn, and I do like that suggestion, so I kind of want to pitch that towards the team. I mean, I'm sure they've seen it, but I kind of like that one since he should be married to Eowyn. We'll go ahead and take this for now, just so we can get the family tree. You know, we'll get it. We'll get it a little busy out there, shall we? Now we did get our mount, our fountain guard trained, which is going to be great. We're spending money at Minas Tirith to get the Governor's Quarters up and running. And Land Clearance has finished in Saraland. 
Um, we wanted the practice ranges here in West Australia, so we'll have to save our money for that. A few new faction family members, which is nice. We're not doing too well financially, but that's okay. It's just because the AI cheats. Now, it looks like Mordor is just sending Moran and Guard, Orc Archers, and more Moran and Guard at our way. So I'll sally out there in a moment. But first, we'll do this battle out here with Hirluin and Nenian. I think this should be enough. Uh, what? Got ambushed. I literally ran towards them. Hold on. Okay, well, that was ridiculous. I literally just walked towards them. I could see them. How did they ambush you? Okay, at least we didn't actually get ambushed, so... <laughs> we'll bring Denny in here. I guess that'll be the next turn. This is annoying, isn't it? Like, I mean, I probably could have beaten that. One pikeman versus all of this, and I have a really good cavalry unit. I think I would have been fine, but... Still, that is ridiculous, isn't it? I, that should not have happened. I could see them. How did they get ambushed? Oh, well, sometimes the game just rolls the dice that way. All right, we will sally out. I will probably... I don't really need to bring in another unit. I think these two would be fine. But the Fountain Guard are just going to be sitting here doing nothing anyway. Arguably, we could bring in the Gondor Archers. They're going to be fighting a lot of them. But I think, I, I think the Fountain Guard would be better. We'll bring them in, get the elites in here. They're going to reinforce the settlement and let us fight. Huron, Huron of the Keys, the first battle of the campaign. Give this a save here. Will be that tool. Simple name there. Captain Imrahil joins Huron of the Keys against Captain Mozu. I'm excited for this because I have two extra mods that have been applied to my Medieval 2. Which, the first is going to be this beautiful, beautiful free cam. Look at that. We can just get down and into the, you know, all the way down at ground level, looking up at the gorgeous soldiers of Gondor here. I mean, I, I love this mod. Free cam is amazing, and I don't know why I haven't been playing with it before, because you can just zoom all the way out. Let's get our, let's get our army out here, shall we? Get them started to march, but you can just zoom pretty much as far out of the battle map as you want. Now, if you go high enough, I mean, things are going to render a little bit strange, but still, you can just get this crazy bird's eye view of the battlefield, or just get all the way down to the levels of your units. I might need to adjust the speed. This is very slow. I'll try not to go out that far again, but just the control that you get with that mod is beautiful. And the other thing that... I will definitely take some feedback on is going to be the shader presets that I have applied here. So I've installed reshade for Medieval 2. We have a little bit of cinematic blurring in the background, slight visual overhaul. Now the only downside is it does make the UI a little bit blurry and there is this brand new UI that was created for this version of version uh, or of Divide and Conquer, this beautiful gorgeous Gondoran UI. But it does make it blurry here as it's kind of out of the focal point of the bloom effect. But I just think this looks the game look absolutely stunning in combination with just the gorgeous work that has gone into the details of these units. It really makes this just look so beautiful. I mean, this game is 2000 from 2006, but yet we can still make it look absolutely gorgeous. So I very much love that as well. So let me know if you like the shader or not, or if you don't, I can always change that. It's very customizable, but I do think the camera is going to be here to stay. I mean, this amount of control is just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, getting down at the same level as our troops here, I might adjust the speed a little bit for a little bit of smoother panning with my mouse keys, but still, still I love it. So Fountain Guard, oh, oh. That's one thing, you cannot press the middle mouse button. It, it makes the camera get a bit janky. And if I press that, things get a little wacky. So I'll try not to do that too much. Right, we should be in range soon. Our archers have a huge range advantage over the orcs and will want to take out the orc archers. I think they have only one, right? You can take out the orc archers and then the captain's bodyguard can easily, easily deal with Moran and Guard and what well, at least just is it two Moran and Guard? It is two Moran and Guard, very weak units. The Captain's Bodyguard of Gondor just vastly outclasses them. We're a 12 and 32 attack defense uh, bodyguard unit. I mean these guys don't they just don't die. 
move them up a little bit. The only annoying thing with the free cam mod is that my run button is also my pan up button, and that's just a little minor annoyance that we've got there, but it's not too bad at the end of the day. I can also just try to double click with the units instead. We'll get in on these volleys. Get nice and down into the archers. Look at that. That is just gorgeous. Getting down in the grass and everything. Love the angles that can be seen here. A little bit bright. This is a very bright and sunny day in... Uh, where are we again? <laughs> Kyra Andros. I forgot for a second. Very bright, sunny, snowy day. Winter has come and the orcs shall taste the bitter cold as steel arrows fire into their, you know, fire through their armor from beyond their reach. Even the orc archers look pretty good with the reshade presets, but they are showing their age a little bit there. That's just the folly of the orcs. They are due for a little bit of an upgrade here. I do think the AI is going to be slightly broken here. They're probably just going to hang out here the whole time. And Oh, does speeding up my camera also? Does that also mess with my camera? Okay, well that might be a thing too. Seems like maybe pressing buttons there might also mess with my camera. So that's the only kind of janky part about it to be watched out for. Alright, these orc archers looks like... Are they running towards my Fountain Guard? That's okay. I mean, I'll beat the Fountain Guard. No worries. I've already slain most of that Moran and Guard unit, too. They're not doing so well. Looks like they are going to be in range. I probably should have retreated a little bit. But we can take a few casualties here. That's okay. In fact, we're definitely going to take a little more than is comfortable. But now that the... Uh, now that we have the... Captain's bodyguard in melee, charging into these orc archers. They should make short work of them. And our fountain guard should be here very soon to reinforce against the Moranin guard. We're going to get flanked here a little bit. That's okay. We'll have the archers shoot at the other unit. Here comes the charge. Our spearmen versus their spearmen. Honestly, the Moranin guard and orc archers don't have a chance in this battle, especially when the fountain guards show up. But even then, I don't think they could really beat these Captain's Bodyguard unless they dogpiled them from all sides. And even then, I don't know if the Moran and Guard have the combat prowess to be able to do that. And we're getting nasty, nasty error volleys right into their flank. Fountain Guard on their way. Now the Orc Archers look like they've disengaged a bit here. Fire against these Moran and Guard. Let's switch to the ones that have retreated out of combat. I don't want to hit... My captain's bodyguard with a Thillian Ranger arrows. Now, they are very accurate, but still, that is more damage than I would want them to take, considering the Moran and Guard aren't going to do any damage to them. Hardly any. Right, looks like we're still shooting at the Moran and Guard. One last volley in before they engage with the Fountain Guard. I think our, I think our general's got it covered here. Let's get one more volley in since the we have a little bit of space here before we engage with the Moran and Guard. Come on, archers. One more volley. One more volley. There it goes. Beautiful damage. We'll run them over there. Get the Fountain Guard in melee. They should make very short work of the Moran and Guard. I don't anticipate them slaying a single Fountain Guard model. And if they do, then... That orc deserves a promotion and to survive this battle if he manages to get any of these Fountain Guard. Super elite Gondorian pikemen. Yeah, they, they don't have a chance. They absolutely don't have a chance. I'm kind of tempted to not even fire into the flanks. Like, I know I could safely, but at the end of the day, do I even want to risk a single arrow going into a Fountain Guard and slaying him when the Moran and Guard can't do it? I don't think I do. I think we'll just chase the routing orc soldiers here, and we'll get a flank with the captain's bodyguard. Oh, my men, brave men of Gondor. Oh, it looks like the cutscene has happened. The general is dead. One thing with the free cam is it doesn't zoom in like that, but it does show the kind of cropped border effect. All in all, a very successful first battle for this campaign. I mean, we, we definitely weren't gonna lose that. But in that battle, looks like we only lost 10 men, 4 of the Athelian Rangers, and about 7 of the General's Bodyguard. Two of the Rangers did heal, which is nice, so that's two casualties that will come back 
and the bodyguards do replenish over time as well. So we can just imagine those bodyguards, they took wounds, they are out of commission until they recover. They'll go back to the healer's halls, they'll get some king's foil. Although actually they won't get king's foil because at this time that knowledge was lost to the men of Gondor and the healers of Gondor. They didn't know about the effect of Athalas. But whatever other medicine Gondor has will go to those brave bodyguards and they shall return in service. To an early ransom, they're not going to take it, which is a-okay. I really don't mind. Getting a little bit of money just for selling out. I think we get some, or do we not get some for selling out? We did. We got 300 gold. Then Captain Immerhill back to the fort where he was before. And we're looking okay. Now, we are probably going to have a defensive siege shortly here at Western Osgiliath. So I probably want to move these Fountain Guard in. That is going to help us a lot with the defense. It's a very elite army, and we can also bring in the trebuchet as needed to reinforce the armies as well. That trebuchet can either go Carandros or towards uh, West Osgiliath. I probably want to get the Mason's Hall. I mean, I want the practice range. I want the Osgiliath veterans. We'll go for that for right now just to save some money. And was it next turn? Yeah, next turn we'll be able to fight Captain Canyon. It's... I could maybe attack him with Denanian, but I don't think he's going to reinforce in that kind of order. So we'll end the turn. Should have another battle there, and I'm almost certain Mordor is going to besiege us with another army here. A new general has been brought to our attention. A suitable husband for the betrothed, or betrothed Evoran. Now he is a promising commander, which is good. Three command stars is not bad. Confident defender, strong at the walls. But he is a liar, and he's hateful and unconcerned. He does have talent with numbers, which is always good, but otherwise, uh, those aren't so... Those aren't great traits to really have. So we will not be recruiting you or welcoming you to the family tree, Andrew, here. We'll look for someone a little more chivalrous in the future. Now here, Lewin and Denenian, since this falls under his command, they shall fight Captain Canyon. We'll get rid of these dastardly pirates. Give another save here, just in case of any funky crashes or anything like that. The engine overhaul project is new to Divide and Conquer, and there's always the possibility of crashes occurring. And in fact, the reason that it took me a little longer to get to this point and to actually record the campaign is because we had a few issues with crashes in the previous weeks. So, but now things seem relatively stable. Knock on wood. Here they are, the Pinnitgelen cavalry looking resplendent in their green armor and those long oval like kite shield that they wield. We've got the new Gondor infantry with their new visuals looking absolutely gorgeous there. I mean, they're still pretty similar. They're Gondor infantry at the end of the day, but they have been given a visual touch up, at least in their upgraded models. So they are looking absolutely fantastic and on Floss Pikemen pretty much unchanged. We have a great front line, and I'm tempted just to keep it like this. Move them up a little bit. Our main damage here is going to be from the Penneth Gallon Cavalry, and it's going to be a little annoying trying to use the run key. I'm going to try to double click because if I press R, that I actually rotate my camera upwards, which is slightly annoying. Let's get an early, early charge here on these Corsair archers, trying to cover our advance as the Gondor Infantry and the Onfloss Pikemen make their way. The one issue is going to be the Azrazair Crossbowmen. If they get a volley off on our generals, that's going to do some damage, but a big charge coming in right into the Corsair Archers. Our shields and lances are down. Corsair Raiders are going to try to engage here. We're going to pull out here, can we actually get a charge over here? It looks like we can get another formation charge. The reason I'm charging back in is because the Azra Zaire are going to be firing at us, and I don't want them hitting the cavalry. Looks like they've hit the Gondor infantry. They've done quite a bit of damage there, taking out... I think they took out seven men in the charge. That's not too bad, honestly, at the end of the day. The shields definitely kept them alive. Come on, and pull around the back. Gonna activate a defensive stance. Arcing shots for crossbows are utterly useless. They will do absolutely nothing to our Gondor infantry and its raining so recovered. General's gone down. <laughs> oh, I love that. I actually kind of love having that little effect, but not being teleported into like the general cam there. Corsair raiders are routing. The pirates are fleeing. 
Only the Azrazire crossbowmen will keep them in the fight, but even then, it is pretty much doomed for them any second now. Thunder Infantry and Floss Pikemen keep on chasing down our enemy. Like some of the pirates did come back, I think. Another charge there in the fork in the background as our Gondor infantry and the pikes move in together to fight these Corsair Raiders. Let's move them in a little bit farther. Come on, lads, get in there. Pile in, men of Gondor. Stay in combat with the Ezra's Air Crossbows for a little bit longer. Men of Gondor, these brave soldiers. Brave infantry. I absolutely love Gondor infantry, and honestly, one of the reasons I wanted to play this campaign with the militia restrictions is because I want my armies to be these men in the just awesome looking steel armor of Gondor. I want this to be my bread and butter, and they've definitely performed well in this battle, taking a few crossbow volleys, but they should replenish, as the engine overhaul project does allow for replenishment beyond the 77 limit. I don't know if that's for sure been implemented at this time, but I believe it should just be working automatically, which will be nice. Scholar Infantry can stay topped off in Denanian's regiment, which is going to be absolutely huge for our playstyle. Let's have you guys run, hit those Corsair Raiders, we'll send the pikes up. This is what happens when you don't fully chase down your enemy, they do come back. It's mildly annoying, but as soon as the Gondor Infantry can engage, have any more issues with them. We're going to turn off, hit these Corsair Raiders. Try to get the Pinneth Gallum Cavalry away from the charging Corsair Raiders here. Not too bothered about them really at the end of the day. Should take out another amount of pirates here. Should take out most of them. They should be routing any second now. Catch up with the Corsair Raiders. These dang archers are staying in combat longer than they really should. And there we go. The battle is over. We'll chase a few down. We really don't have to. It's a rebel army. They'll die anyway. But you know what? I'm going to do it. We might be able to get another chevron on our bodyguards if we're lucky. Cut down every last pirate. Show them that this is not a way of life in Middle Earth. They will be cut down by Numenori and Steel and the descendants of her as well. All right, we'll go ahead and close that battle now. 47 to 835, I think we know who took the cake here. Pinneth Gallon Cavalry, 451 kills against those lightly armored Corsair Raiders. Took a little bit of damage with our main infantry, but, I mean, crossbow volleys will do that at the end of the day. They are still quite strong. And speaking of crossbows and an Indian, another beloved character in the mod has had his bodyguard change, and that is Forthwin of Dorwinian. No longer will Forthwin have the Regent's Bodyguard. Instead, Forthwin now has the Regent's Bowguard, giving you a very, very solid, very powerful crossbow unit to play with at the beginning of the Dorwinian campaign. And honestly, the Regent's Bowguard are the main reason you would go for the men route anyway. They're such good crossbowmen. And of course, the Paladins of the Vintner Court are also amazing units, the Cavalry and the Knights, but especially 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 the regent's bow guard they're just so so good we have quelled the raiders at the shores of onphalos and we shall now send here lewin to enulon where they will regroup grab a few more pikemen and attempt to then take thara grandos and if we are so lucky we may be able to take boloran as well where we can build mines and capture a gold resource which would really help with the income on that side of the world your orders and you know, since we are going to go that way, I will actually... Do I have a mission? Do I have any missions? Let's check that. Send an emissary to Dual Golder. I mean, that's a weird place My to send an emissary. What do we even get for that? Let's check it. 750 gold. We'll take it, and then we'll move westwards, heading to Rohan, and then to Enidwise. Since I'd much rather have an alliance with them than, you know, anything else out there. Now, I do have Grishnok. Grishnok is not besieging us, but I do think I want to take the opportunity... To take him out, get rid of that, you know, decently powerful commander. I kind of want to use the trebuchet in this battle, too. You know, let's do it. Let's bring the trebuchet in. I want to bring the fountain guard or gone and bring the archers, because I might not have enough movement range for them to come back. I think we'll take the fountain guard. We'll want the elite infantry. And we shall take out Grishnok, who has just trash. Uruk bodyguard with him. And two orc archers and an orc host. Should be no problem. We'll get a little bit of fun with the artillery. And honestly, like, 
Kirby Sheets aren't that great anyway. Like, they're great in Siege, they're great in, like, choke points, but they are still very inaccurate. But we're freaking Gondor. I've always thought, you know, Gondor should have a starting trebuchet. It just feels right. Like, that should be their unique thing. I don't know. I think regular ammo is more accurate than flaming. We'll leave it as that for now. Billion Rangers, let's spread you guys out. I'll have one over there, and another will take the high ground. Fountain Guard and the Captain's Bodyguard will be the main military force here. Are at will trebuchet. Let's move you up. Probably take the high ground with our troops if we can. Maybe even split them up a little bit. We do outnumber... We don't necessarily outnumber the orcs, but we do have five units to their four. So we can play around with that and our archers on the flanks by trying to occupy their infantry on both sides and cross-firing. I kind of wish there was like a drawing marker I could use here, but my thought is... Fountain Guard over here. These Athelian Rangers can shoot the orcs over here where my captain's bodyguard will be, and the Athelian Rangers on the left flank can shoot an infantry on the right flank. Now, are we in range? We do appear to be in range. Let's stop for now. Shoot at the orc archers. We are just in range for them. Let's go ahead and do a loose formation. Moving the fountain guard up there. First few trebuchet volleys coming in. No good volleys yet. That's okay. They are quite inaccurate. If we get lucky, though, we might be able to get a cheeky kill on their general, and that would be absolutely huge for just destroying their morale. Let's go ahead and get our archers into loose formation just to make them a little more sturdy here. I do have a little bit of concern if the trebuchet should hit our own troops. That would not be good. We're not going to get any kills, but there is the spectacle. There we go. We got a few kills. Bring up the captain's bodyguard just to screen against the archers. Again, we're probably not going to do too much damage to these archers. We're probably going to have a bit of a standoff, which is unfortunate. I really should probably just... Oh, 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 I should not have done that. I should not have pressed that button. <laughs> oh, I am so lost. I need to not press that button. Okay, do not press the middle mouse button. All right, we're taking more casualties than I would like against these orc archers. I think I will pull back after this next volley comes in. Yeah, let's get out of there. We're not trading too effectively. Alright, Trebuchet, you're just not doing, I mean, anything at all. I didn't expect much. Like, to be honest, I really didn't expect much, but still. Yeah, I think, well, they are still just standing here. Okay, guys, can you move, please? Whatever, at least we should have them hopefully flanked by the Captain's Bodyguard. And my archers are just all over the place. The Mortar is playing very defensively here. Our archers are not having a good time at the moment, but at least we've caught one unit of orc archers with our heavy infantry. Come on, they're going to run away from combat. That's okay. We should get a few kills. Another few trebuchet volleys. Not getting the impact that I want, and that one was way, way too close to my general for comfort. I did not like that one, one bit. No, sir. Let's not have that happen again, shall we? <laughs> and that is the danger with artillery. It can just be so, so, so inaccurate. That's why I want to have flaming shot on, just so that I can clearly see where these shots are going. Are we going to get a good shot? There we go. A good amount of orc host going down there. Looks like we took about, what is that, 15 in one shot? Nice hit. And archers are definitely better at killing than... Trebuchets, but I just like the visual spectacle. I almost never get to play around with it, so I don't think it's overpowered. Plus, this thing is leeching 400 gold a turn from my treasury, so it, it is fair in my opinion. Archers are now engaged against the Fountain Guard, so we'll go ahead and peel back the General's Bodyguard. Being a little disoriented with the camera controls here. Urk Bodyguard are armor piercing, so we want to be a bit careful with that. I think if I, if I can, it'd be best to shoot into the Orc Bodyguard. We have another shot going into the Orc Host. Come on, don't miss, please. Are they just going to keep running away? They're just going to keep running away. All right, let's, let's go ahead and engage them. I don't think the Catapult is going to be useful anymore. It's very much just going to miss all of its shots. 
See if we can get a few kills with the archers against the Uruk bodyguard. Yep, we're getting a few of them knocked down there. They do have shields. They are going to stay alive for a bit longer than traditional units. Orc archers fighting to the very end here, though. It looks like Uruk bodyguard might just now be turning around. This is good news for us. Bring these fountain guard in. Now, we do have some risk here with our general. I'm going to bring the fountain guard back into combat here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That could be bad. Ooh. We got a few orc archers with it, though. That was good. So shooting at the orc bodyguard or coaster being shot. Let's switch over to the orc archers as the fountain guard now move to engage against the orc host. I think the orc bodyguard are going to get defeated by the captains. These orc hosts really not going to do much on the charge here. They have very, very poor attacks. What is it, like four attack? Four attack. Oh, got disoriented with the camera again. I have one downside to that mod. I might have to do some configuration to get that to work a little bit better. But still, I like this control. I can just have a free movement with my mouse, which is very... Oh, no, 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 Okay. All right. All right, you guys are done. You guys are done. You are no longer firing in this combat. No more. Trebuchets are done. That was way too close. I didn't like that. Uh, our general is not having a good time against these Uruk bodyguard. It's relatively even. Where is our general himself? I want to make sure he's safe. Is he in the front line or is he in the back ranks? One of the Black Numenorean captains fighting here. I can't quite see him. I really don't know where our general is. He might be in the front line. He might be a bit deep. Oh, there he is. Okay, he's good. He's good. He's safe for now. We are... We've pretty much defeated the Orc Archers. They should route any second now. Foundguard did take a little bit of damage from the Orc Host, but at the end of the day, they absolutely crushed them. They had like 200 to start with. And I think killing 200 and losing 4 is a very good ratio to have. Killing the last of the Orc Host. They are fighting to the death. Grishnok is a great general for the Orcs here. Come on, take out the last of the Orc Host so you can help the captain. Getting a little bloody over here. The Uruk's definitely showing their power. They have armor piercing, so that does give them quite the offensive capabilities. Like one Orc host is left. Can we take him out? We really don't need to be stuck on him, but let's get rid of him anyway. There he goes. All right, Fountain Guard. Going to help with the Uruk bodyguard now. Get out of shield wall, so maybe we can get a charge animation to go off. I doubt it. Definitely doubt it, but still, let's get them running in there. Come on, lads. They charge, and then they go into pike formation. Come on, get in there. We have 14 Uruk bodyguards to kill. I think the archers are almost all dead. That they are. And I think I don't have permanent arrows turned on, but I, I'll try to get that turned back on for this campaign later. I, I like having permanent arrows. There we go. Last of the bodyguard are falling. Now that the fountain guard have joined the fray, they got absolutely crushed. Such a good unit. Honestly, Fountain Guard are incredible. Incredible. And look at them. They're just so freaking cool. I always wanted to get a Gondor army on the Middle Earth tabletop game and just run a bunch of Fountain Guard because they're just so, so cool. We have defeated Grishnok, losing only 40 brave Gondorians in the process. Healed a few of the Rangers, which is great. I like having the archers in tip top shape. Then we'll get to see if Grishnok has a defeat trait. It would be interesting to see, wouldn't it? If not, then I am almost certain Gothmog would have one if Grishnok doesn't. Grishnok is one of the named orcs. I think... Uh, was he... Was he at Kirith Ungol, or was he one of the orcs that was sent with Mordor forces to aid Isengard? I can't quite remember. I think he was more in Isengard's area. I think... Isn't Grishnok the one that wants to eat Merry and Pippin before they escape into the forest and he follows them into Fangorn and then Treebeard promptly squishes him? I think that's the one. If there's any defeat trait, it might happen on the end of the next turn. I'll see in a moment here. We can bring the um we can bring the heavy hitters back to the fort for that free upkeep. And we have 5,000 gold to play with here, which is just great. We can get those mines, which is going to give us a huge amount of income. That does expend all of our money for now. I'm thinking we'll want to get maybe another meeting hall, get the extra free upkeep. 
That way, Huron also gets free upkeep here, and it just you know makes things a little cheaper at the end of the day. So we should have another archer on his way to Anulond. What we'll do now is we'll put Hirluin and these Gundar militia into this fort, get a little bit more free upkeep. Maybe even send Denenian. Well, no, Denenian can stay there. They'll go there, get free upkeep. We're going to have to play some min-maxing with that. And I really need to get like a free upkeep unit here in Saraland. But we just don't have the capabilities at this time. Which is okay. I want to make sure I didn't miss any other free upkeep units. I think we're good. I mean, Eorthorn is going to hang out here in Tarnos without much to do. But that's A-OK. -okay. Free upkeep, free upkeep, free upkeep. It's just less, um, four along the fat. So if we get a barracks here... That'll help. And I really do want to get a barracks in Kerasas because getting extra, um, getting the extra Axemen of Lasarnok is going to be quite useful. Now, I might need to transition to the Fiefdom Barracks soon because that'll give us all of these units that we can play around and recruit with. At the moment, I can't really recruit anyone at this time. I mean, I can get Fountain Guard and I can get Athelion Rangers, but that's... Honestly, all I can recruit at the moment at this front line area. So even though I did want to go for that meeting hall, I might need to put this on hold on the next turn to then get the fiefdom barracks when we have the funds. And well, we won't have the funds for that for a moment. I mean, we could cancel that, but I really don't want to cancel the mines. I think they are too valuable. And we're going to need the governor's quarters anyway. Question is, can our elite forces survive for the time being against all that Gondor, or all that Mordor has here? I mean, there's already two full banner armies in this region. We'll just have to wait and see. And we got another potential governor for our land. Bera here, he does have management talent and is a skilled bureaucrat. Just honestly, not too bad. He's honest, which will help with public order and fair in rule for additional renown. I'm tempted to take him. I feel like I could potentially wait it out and get someone better, but it would be nice to have someone sitting all the way in Saralong and those other far-reaching provinces. So I think we're gonna take Bear here. I like his portrait. I like who I like his uh the cut of his jib here. We'll take him. Now Bear here, thankfully, is already way over here in Calumbell. That is perfect. So Bear here will become the governor of Saralond for the time being. Marriage celebrations and all that good stuff. Now let's check the construction report. Longelan has the grain exchange completed. We're making about 4,300 gold a turn. Longelan is really making money. I think the roads do too. Port is going to also help us with some income. I think I'll do the port and then wait out the rest of the money so that we can get the... Oh, what do you call it? Get the feet and barracks. Although, I might have the ability... Just to hold out. I mean, that's eight turns. That's a long time. I could get that earlier. Five turns versus eight turns to then start recruiting Blackroot Vale archers in the front lines. I think I want that. So we're going to do that. We're going to hold off on the port for another turn at Longelin. And we'll see if maybe we can squeeze a little bit of money yes, out from either a battle here. I don't think we'll be able to do... Maybe, maybe against Mordor we can squeeze out some map info. Actually, I don't think we're going to get map info from them. My lord. Check with our scouts, see if there's anyone we can talk to. Quiet. Doesn't look like My it. Lord. Yes. Alright, we're going to go for the port. We're going to grab that first. My initial thought. And we'll get the governor's quarters to keep working. And then next turn we can actually start the fiefdom barracks. We could spend a little more money. We're making more money here in Ethering. Maybe grab the land clearance, and we should still have enough, right? But we actually won't if we do that, so we don't want to do that. Save the money, we'll be able to uh, build it next turn. And we also need to get free upkeep here in Callanhan. We're bleeding a little bit here. I could get rid of the Territorial Guardsmen. I'm just going to keep them as a police unit for now, just in case. We're kind of maxing up our free upkeep slots at the moment. The four down here. Have a taste of my it would be good to probably sally out and try to take out Shagdush. I would need to get some rangers out in this army, though. If we're going to do that, it's going to be doing an offensive battle. Have I think it's worth it. Play. Cut them out now. Get the money for the battle. Have a I'm nice Osgiliath you. battle to end this, You'll you know, campaign fight. section with for today's episode. So we'll do that. Bring in the trebuchet, we're gonna bring in the Gondor archers, we're gonna bring in the heavy hitters, we're just gonna be 
We're gonna be a little overprepared, and that's okay. Let's go ahead and fight Shagdouche versus Ishkaz. We're gonna give it another save here. Shagdouche also brings in a general, General Luger. We've got Moran and Guard, Morgul Chosen, Black Uruk. Okay, yeah, we, we definitely want to take out some of these guys. And we can even take out Ishkaz as well. I probably won't be sallying out at this time to the Eastern Osgiliath, but still, it, it, it might be worth it. Maybe this is the battle where we do take East Osgiliath. I don't really like to have it that much. I think it's better just to hang out kind of in the back area. My camera is moving very slow on this battle map, which is interesting. Position there, we might be able to coax the enemy to fight on our side, which would be actually great. Pretty much all of our infantry do need to be over here if we're going to use them in this battle. Let's see if we can get Gondor Archers. Can I take the bridge? Doesn't look like I can. I can get about that far, right? Can I? They can make it up there. This is perfect. Okay. Send the Gondor Archers up that way. I don't think I'm going to be able to get the Trebuchet anywhere. Because they're attacking us. I don't... Or we're attacking them. I don't know if they're going to come towards us. Looks like they might, though. We might be able to play this defensively yet offensively. In fact, I think we will. Osgiliath veterans, go ahead and hang out here. Gondor archers, let's put you over there. I want my spearmen and my fountain guard over by the bridge as the Gondor archers and the Athelian rangers take to the high ground. We get the trebuchet up there, wouldn't it? Come on, trebuchet. Maybe I should move it far over here. I think we're already in range. Let's just start firing. We'll see what happens. I feel in rangers. Let's stop you there. I think we're just about in range. Oh, come on. Fall back a little bit, please. Gondor archers are going to be fighting from the ramparts here, though. They are going to be shooting through buildings. But once the forces of Mordor make it a little bit farther past, <laughs> and they, they're over here, we'll be able to shoot directly into their flanks and do a lot of damage that way. All right, Trebuchet, please fire. Just fire at will. I don't care what you fire at. Fire at something. Arguably, we don't really want to spend too much ammo on just basic orc archers. From the first of the volleys, we're going to get any good shots. Uh, the two missed. Third should be coming any moment now. And, uh, okay, we got a few orc hosts there. That's good. That's very good, actually. Target the Black Uruks for now. You guys probably also target the Black Uruks. Probably want everyone targeting those Black Uruks once they're in range. I mean, it will definitely do some serious, serious damage. I think we'll bring Fountain Guard up to the front. Oh, I hear damage. Got a few Orc hosts. And maybe this is the cheesy part of my campaign is using it here, but I just think it's it's just visually, you know, really fun. I, it'd be a lot... It, I think it'd be boring if I didn't have some artillery here just blasting orcs away until they end up, you know, overwhelming me, but I, I imagine this army could probably tank the garrison for a while. But it, it's just to make the campaign a little different. A little different from the traditional experience. Great trebuchet shots, close range, huge damage onto those black perks. I switch to the Morgul Chosen now as we get a little bit closer in combat here. Here, we are definitely missing a few shots here with our infantry. Let's move them back a little bit. Uruk Bodyguard and Black Uruk, let's target them, shall we? Might get a lucky shot on the Bodyguard, too, with the Trebuchet. Of course, should the Trebuchet get engaged in melee, it's going to no longer be of use to us. I might not be able to shoot anymore. I think it might be... Oh, there we go. Ooh, a big shot right where the Uruk Bodyguard was. That is brilliant to see. Right, we're going to switch target to the Black Uruk Halberd to shoot a few in the back line here. Alright, Fountain Guard going to hold the line bravely. Gondor Infantry will stand back to defend. While well, the Gondor Spearmen will look at them, get close-ups on that beautiful, beautiful new armor. Absolutely gorgeous, isn't it? We are missing a few of our shots here. We're going to be doing some arcing shots, that's okay. Let's not hit our Spearmen, shall we? We did just lose a man to friendly fire. That wasn't very friendly. A few more artillery shots going in, taking out Black Uruk Halberts, and Boromir, save the line. 
There he goes, never again will the land of his people fall into the hands of Mordor. Alright, we'll send in the Gondor infantry. We are just absolutely crushing these guys out here. Kind of want to send these Gondor archers to now flank, so we'll see if we can get them to go that way. It's still good to fire into the flank from up here. Yeah, we'll keep shooting. We'll keep shooting. We're going to need to take out the... We're going to need to take out those bodyguards anyway. See if we can get a little bit closer here with the... Uh, with the Gondor archers here. Boromir's not doing too much damage from back here. Oh, we even had more Athelion Rangers. We could have moved up here. We should do that. We should get them in a better position. Mountain Guard and Gondor Infantry are holding the line bravely against the Orc Tide. It is to be expected, isn't it? Archers, let's shoot. I think our trebuchet is no longer able to fire. I think it's just too close. That one might have a shot. Oh, 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 let's not go that way, shall we? Come on, can we get one shot in there? That would be absolutely beautiful. I don't think it's going to be able to. I think the angle is just a little bit too danger close. I think the trebuchet is done. I mean, we might be able to pull him out, but then I'm at such a risk of hitting my own troops if I do. We'll pull them out a little bit. Mountain Guard absolutely keeping the Black Orcs away. Alright, we need to get Boromir in there. We want to use another leadership. Don't think we do yet. We'll save that for now. Alright, Black Orc Halberds are making it into combat, which isn't good. Okay, let's shoot into those Moran and Guard and Morgul Chosen in the back, shall we? Another leadership, screw it, why not? Alright, you guys need to be moving up there, please. Boromir, get in the combat. You guys are absolute gentlemen. Absolute badasses. The Osgiliath veterans. Their upgraded armor. The steel plate of Gondor. And the forces of Mordor crushed for us to 58% to 4%. Of course, once they do get in the melee, a few soldiers, a few brave, brave soldiers, and even some of our brave archers may fall. And there is the orc bodyguard in here. The Gondor infantry is taking a bit of damage, that's to be expected. The Fountain Guard are no longer in their good defensive formation. That's okay. I think these Gondor archers are out of ammo, so let's send them out that way. Can we flank? I think we can. We have a few more shots coming in here. We'll shoot at the back line. Try to get a few more kills with the archers. And maybe I'll shoot at the back line with the trebuchets. We'll see if we can get any cheeky damage here. I think they're back just far enough where the low accuracy of the trebuchet won't hit our own troops. Hard to say. Come on, guys. Big aim. Uruk Bodyguard is sitting right there. Here it comes. Alright, got a few. Kind of a whiff. Two shots also going in the back. Kind of whiffing here, but if, if we can kill the Bodyguard, then the army will rout. Gondor Infantry lost about 26 men so far. They're doing their best, but they are up against Uruk Bodyguard, so that is a very tough fight for the Gondor Infantry. A good fight for the Bodyguard. I think that there's not too many of them left to slay. And eventually... Oh, and look at that. Another good shot right into the Morgul Chosen. Ooh, that was deadly. Right into the other blob of Morgul Chosen. Moran and Guard going down. If we can kill their Bodyguard, though, that's going to be very, very nice. Our one weakness at the moment is a lack of armor-piercing troops. We really just have to go up against them. Numenorean steel to Black Uruk steel. They're trying their best. Gondor Infantry doing well enough here, fighting the Uruk Bodyguard. Still a bloody, bloody conflict. Come on, can we get a lucky shot? Can we kill that general that's hanging out back here? Two shots in the same area. Uruk Bodyguard is down to 17. Looks like that orc is still very lucky, but one good shot right on him will take him out. Push these rangers to now shoot at the Moran and Guard. They're a little bit squishier than the... Well, I guess they're about this. They're a little squishier than the Morgul Chosen, and we can probably get into their backs here, getting a few more kills. Oh, did that get him? Oh, that one got him. There goes the first general. Luger has fallen. We still have the other general, but he is engaged up against Uruk Bodyguard, so I think in time, 
he will fall. Now let's get the Fountain Guard in a better formation. Get them in a wider stance, help them push against more of the Orc host. Orc Bodyguard down to nine. We will basically be fighting till the end here. Activate another instance of leadership. Got to get another few kills, maybe take out the Orc Bodyguard or just take out the Blobby units here. It's tempting to fire at this blob, but I think it's just a little close to my infantry here. I really don't want to hit my own guys if I took aim at this section of Morgul Chosen. Looks like our reinforcements have arrived. They are going to start to flank along the bridge here. Just get down and into the combat with our forces. Flaming rocks flying overhead. Archers firing from the defensive position here. You know, definitely a choke point battle heavily in our favor, but we still lost 10% and with the restrictions, these battles will hurt us and we really have to make the most. Looks like the enemy general has finally fallen and I think these orcs are no longer going to be fighting in this world. Another trebuchet shot hits like the Moranin guard here near the Morgul Chosen. We might be able to flick a cow in there and really just break the rest of their morale. A few cow corpses, which probably shouldn't scare the Moranin guard, but still, I'll take any morale debuff I can get to finish this fight. Gunner infantry have fought very hard in this battle. Probably turn off the fire at will. We really don't need to be firing overhead like that. All right, looks like they are now wavering due to the corpses. We don't need to fire any more. Got a shield wall going on here. Look at that new UI for the shield wall. That's pretty cool. I love that. But I wonder if the skill drum has a new UI too. The fountain guard have a new UI. No, they still have the same spear wall. Well, interesting. All right, thunder archers exhausted, but now flanking. And there goes the orcs. We'll probably try to ransom out anything we can. Let's get a little bit of money, a few hundred orcs here, probably 110, 120 or so. Oh, there's another orc bodyguard that showed up. Where did they come from? Oh, this is the, uh, oh, this is the, that's the other orc bodyguard. That's the, uh, the garrison one. Okay, I did not anticipate them coming back, so I saved nothing for them. All right, Fountain Guard, you're exhausted, but you are needed in the front line. Help deal with the last of the Orc Bodyguard. I really shouldn't have the Archers in there. I should have Boromir in there. Push in. We need to get those Archers out of combat, as the Archers are just not equipped for this type of engagement. Boromir should be okay, though. Come on, Boromir, push him back. I don't even know his name. He's not important. There we go. Orc Bodyguard taking some damage. Fountain Guard coming to reinforce, and when they join the fray, that will surely be it for the Orc Bodyguard. Push, lads. Push. Try to peel back the archers if we can. Just have the elites deal with the bodyguard. Fountain Guard, I think I've made it. Push, lads. Push. So we're flanking. We got soldiers around the back of the bodyguard on the bridge. They're just going to get absolutely crushed here. Don't mind the fact that our soldiers are literally standing knee-deep in the concrete. Another brave man of Osbilia Falls. This is truly a glorious day for the men of Gondor. 20 bodyguard remain, but they are getting cut down. Very swift one-on-one -on -one combat here. I guess Brass has overtaken the bridge. There goes the last general, and I'm sure the bodyguard are now to follow. <laughs> a beautiful victory by the men of Gondor. We lost 16%. Totally worth it. We might honestly want to get the healing outposts here just to help us maybe get Boromir some battle doctors or surgeons just to help out with the casualty replenishment. All right, we'll end that battle 136 to about 2200. I mean, those 136, that was a significant portion of our army. And we don't yet have the means to retrain any of these troops except for the Fountain Guard and the Athelian Rangers. Osgiliath uh, veterans, 238 kills. Spearmen didn't do too much. They showed up kind of at the end there. Gondor archers, 120. The infantry took out 270. 
just as much as the Fountain Guard did, 275. Trebuchet also getting a good 265 orcs. These Athelian Rangers, though, that were on the bridge, 460 kills. So I believe they were primarily firing at the lightly armored orc trash. Still worth it. Numbers are good to get rid of. And that's probably how most of our battles are going to go at West Osgiliath. It's going to be a choke point like that. But the hard part will be to replenish our forces over time. I do think that battle map needs an update. I, I think it's just, it's a little too awkward to use. Now, I mean, granted, it makes sense for there being one crossing, but I think there needs to be more open space to fight with on both sides, and maybe even that middle island being a bit bigger, something worth capturing so that you can actually launch an offensive. 706 gold, will they take it? They do not. In fact, I could take East Osgiliath, it's free, it's just, at the same time, it's not even worth it for the sacking income, and it's not even worth it to destroy the buildings there, and it's not worth it to hold it either. So I'm just gonna let Mordor have that on their own end. I mean, we could throw in, I could cheese it, I could just throw in a, a militia there, take the settlement, and like, I mean, we're good to go, right? Then Mordor has to besiege it, we hold it for a turn, but honestly, what's, what's the point? They're just gonna come at us from all sides, and... I'd rather hold West Osgiliath, where Mortar can only send one army at a time versus taking us East Osgiliath, and they can just fill, I believe, five tiles here with armies if they wanted to, and that's just going to be much, much tougher to defend. So My we will Lord just hold on highly to West Osgiliath, and here, why aren't you getting free upkeep here? Oh, it's because I don't have the meeting hall, that's right. But we'll just check our movement in the West, I think we already moved our guys here, no we didn't. We need to get our archer. Oh, he's on his way, Bearer, uh, Bear, was it Bearer here? Yes, just like the ring. Yes. Two more turns, the uh, Blackroot Vale archers will be here, and we'll be able to send uh, Huron with the Root, Vare, the Root Vale archers, the Anfloss pikemen, and Denenian over to Thargrandos, and we will set this place up for recruiting Gondor infantry, and probably get some Gondor cavalry out here. In fact, I'm more tempted to go for a proper stables here in Thargrandos, First, I mean, because we'll have infantry with the Nenian, we can get Onvalos pikemen out in this region of the world, but if we can get a place in the west for dedicated Gondor cavalry, which is going to take, ooh, it's going to take a steward's hall though, and I don't think we can get the steward's hall at the castle, can we? Let's check that. Castle halls, we can, it's going to take three levels of town hall, but if we get that, we can then get proper Gondor cavalry out there. It's probably still better just to go for the guard barracks, because that'll give us the Gondor infantry and the Gondor spearmen. And then, but the steward's hold is also used to get the Gondor archers, so it's it's gonna take some serious development out in this area of the world to get it rolling for our infantry. But I think, I think a steward's hall, or probably, probably a governor's quarters into the barracks into steward's hall, into the cavalry is probably the way to go out here. It's gonna be a tough choice to make. Because we can always get like a, we can get a barracks here in Kirithior to keep, I think we can get the barracks. Well, problems for later, those are. Now we almost have the money to recruit the building that we want, but we'll get that next turn. Can I send anyone back? I actually get the fountain guard back, which I will do. At least there's no Fountain Guard here in the city. But I think we'll take the Gondor Spearmen and the Gondor Archers, send them to the fort. Rich. I'll just kind of cycle it out for free upkeep. End the turn, and basically once this rolls over, I will end the episode here a little longer than an hour. Now uh, here we are on turn 7. Mordor has decided they would attack us with an Orc Captain since I pulled out our reinforcements. We'll have to take care of that on the following episode. We'll just go ahead and run through the um, construction real fast. As if the governor quarters is right there, but it doesn't do anything for us. So we're going to switch to the fiefdom barracks so that we can at least recruit some Onfloss pikemen, some Blackroot Vale archers, some Lebanon marines, all these good units, the clansmen, the squires. Honestly, everything here is very useful, especially since we aren't using the militia. We've got a translator. We have a new family member. Welcome, Halfor. And that will be it for the first episode of Title That for Gondor. 
and I will see you all on the next one. Until then, my friends, farewell.